You're listening to a podcast from The Word. So, Veronica Bennett, as she was when she first entered my life uh, as a member of the Ronettes, and uh, subsequently, obviously, Ronnie Spector, no longer with us, which caused me to to go and go. I sent a golf cart down the far end of the uh, record collection. <laughs> and I, I was actually Get amazed at Groaning with the <laughs> produce. <Yeah. laughs> No, oh, it's amazing. I, 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 it's so long since I'd played this. I'd forgotten I have the first Ronettes album. I have it from uh, when it was reissued in the 70s. And has a great title, doesn't it? Presenting the Fabulous Ronettes featuring Veronica. Featuring Veronica, yes. Yeah. Uh, no, at the point I got it, it was called Ronettes Sing Their Great Hits because it was 70s reissue. But it's the same album. And Sleeve Notes by Roy Carr and pointing out how fortunate you are to be able to hear this, because this had been completely off the market for years. And as a reminder that there was a time, you know, in the 60s and 70s, when if a record was deleted, it didn't reappear. Yeah. You know, it, it was what, just, I mean, every it's, track is fantastic, isn't it's it? It's absolutely it's got what I'd say by Ray Charles on there. Yeah. Um, best part well, of Breaking it, Up, Chapel of Love. It starts with, let me, let me, it starts with walking, walking in the in rain, rain, which is just. It starts with a clap of thunder. I don't want to make. Two, I want to make two points here. Can I make two points? Yeah, go on. There's 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 two uh, ways of uh, of talking about genius, and the most common one is people apply it to individuals. You know, so and so's a genius, but actually, the other way of doing it is genius is a thing that occurs. It's a thing that occurs at certain points of time with certain combinations of people and circumstances. And the whole kind of Ron X thing is an absolute classic case of the latter. Because what you've got working here is not just Ronnie Spector. You've also got the two other Ron X, Nedra and Estelle. And you've got loads and loads of musicians. You know, uh, uh, you've got the Wrecking Crew. You've got Hal Blaine. You've got Tommy Tedesco. You've got Carol Kay. You've got Leon Russell. You've got Ray Pullman. You've got all these people. You've got Phil Spector. You've got Phil Spector's engineer. You've got the songwriters who supplied these bullets on this record. You know, we the likes of Ellie Greenwich and Barry Mann and Amen. Cynthia Waller and, Vin, and Vince, Vinnie Ponzi and all these people. So it's, um, the, nothing points out more eloquently the fact that pop music is a collaborative process yeah. than, you know, what, what came out on these records. And the other thing is, it's just the nature of... Um, Listening to this record, and I listened to it a bunch of times yesterday, and I'm like, God, it sounds fantastic. And it, it what strikes you is this is this is pop music before the pill. This is pop music grounded in an era when the only way you got out of the family home was by marrying somebody. Yeah. There was no period of independence and being full of some fancy free in between. You did one thing and then you did the other. And particularly if you came from slightly you know, less privileged backgrounds and so forth. And so what's wonderful about this record is it's entirely about the dream of being in love, of wanting to be in love and wanting everything that seemed to come with it. And it starts um, walking in the rain with the clap of thunder. And you can't help thinking technically, how difficult was it to synchronize a clap of thunder with a music track in 1963? Must have been really, really hard. There was no technology, was, yeah. no technology to do that kind of thing. You know, you, they did it by trial and error. Anyway, the opening line of walking in the rain is. I want him, I need him, and someday I'll meet him. So he hasn't actually met him at this it's point. It's fantastic. It's a you fantasy, know, isn't it? Yeah. He'll be kind of shy and real good looking too. But I know that he'll be my guy for the things he'll like to do, like walking in the rain. And the whole thing comes in. Behind you, and it's just—it's a dream. 
It's a fantasy of being in love. That was what was so powerful about it. And let's not forget, and this is something people look down their nose at nowadays. You know, Phil Spector did say there were little symphonies for the kids. And if you go and listen to this record, and I cannot urge you too strongly, you can find it, stream it, Spotify, it's, it's there, all those places. Go and listen to the whole thing in sequence. It's just absolutely extraordinary. This is addressed to 13-year-old girls. That's what it's about. It's not adults, you know. It's completely the world of early teenagers, probably more girls than boys. It's it's promoting this, this really attractive fantasy that you could, you know, you're going to meet this guy and it's going to be absolutely wonderful and he's going to kiss you and suddenly the world is going to be utterly transformed and then you're going to fantasize about being married and going off together. And there's actually a song, two, two songs later, is so young, you know, they say we're so young, yeah. you know, we're, we, we're yeah. so young, so young, can't marry no one. Which <laughs> is just absolutely extraordinary. What a reality. Cool irony that the man she did marry turned out to be Phil Spector. Well, yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. But uh, it is this record just throbs all the way through with with the the emotional energy of 13, 14, 15 year olds just wanting life to be utterly transformed by romance. You know, it even finishes with Chapel of Love. Yes. <laughs> going to the chapel, we're going to get married, you know. Yeah. It, it's, it, it just, it swells and it throbs absolutely all the way through. And she has a voice that sounded like herself, but also sounded like every girl. And it's a voice a little bit like, you know, Lou Adler said of Carol King, she has a voice that all women like to think they have. That's right. And I think that's a really important part of it. It's not an Adele voice. It's not a Rita no, Franklin it's not voice. it's theatrical. It's, 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 it's conversational and you it's can completely, join in completely. You, you the pick, other interesting thing about it is you listen to those arrangements, you know, and the kind of bombast that's going on all around, you know, the noise, the drum sound, the, the symphonies, you know, and she still cuts through. She's not drowned out. Absolutely. By Oh, listen, that, that's the genius of the whole thing, is that, uh, I can't remember, is it Baby I Love You or whatever, that that um, you've got this 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 kind of amorphous noise. You can't work out what it what it all is. It, is, is that drums, is that bass, is that piano or whatever. And, and you set over the top of it, you hear castanets really clearly. Yeah. <laughs> the rhythm is dictated by castanets. The sense of drama, the sense of scale, but also intimacy and of deep, about the thing. It's on Be the, My Baby, you listen to there's a drum snare, which I notice is a crack, and then there's a triple crack, and then a single crack and a triple crack, all the way through the opening section. It's absolutely mesmerising. It's Hal Blaine. Oh, it's, it's like, phenomenal. It's, it's, if, it, I was read quite a lot of those obituaries, and if there's one one moment in it uh, that pointed out the kind of world that she, she was in, it's the bit where her mum gives her a load of tissue paper to stuff into her bra to make her look over the legal age to be able to get a job dancing in a mob-owned club. And you think, that, 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 I've already, I've got it now. I've got the world that she's coming from. That is yeah. tough. It's yeah, yeah. But that record, and I, I, you know, I have to say, I didn't even, I'd forgotten I got this. And, uh, and I played it a bunch of times yesterday. This is, this whole LP, and it's, it's kind of odd because Spectre used to say, oh, you know, LPs are a few hits and then a load of filler. Yeah. This is not. No, no, every really, track. Every, every track. Every track. You know, it's got, it's got Be My Baby. It's got Baby, I Love You. It's got the best part of breaking up. Yeah. The best part of breaking up is when we're making up. You know, it's it's the, the, the you know, the, the masterwork of loads and loads of people. And one of them was Ronnie Spectre. The Word Podcast, prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. So, you know, the long winter nights, um, you know, my wife and I the other day going through the cupboard and dug out old films and we rewatched and we haven't seen it for years. And I cannot recommend it more, more vigorously. And that is The Day of the Jackal, 
with James Fox, and I was talking to you about it yesterday. And you, you, uh, you've got the you. Uh, had you recently read the book? You've got the book there. I've got, I've got the yeah. book here. I've, I know the book is rarely far away from me, actually. And I just <laughs> looked. This is a 1973 copy, um, price 50p. Um, so this was I, I, would have been probably before the film. I would have thought the film would have been came out. It was slightly it after was. that because yeah. the book was the book was published in 1971. You know the story of how he wrote it. No, go on. He, he was uh, Frederick Forsyth. This is he was a kind of he was a, he was a reporter, Daily Express reporter, and did a lot of foreign stories, and just wanted to write a bestseller to make a load of money, and so just sat down pretty much in a, in a hotel room for about six months and wrote a bestseller. And it's a, been a bestseller absolutely ever since. And it is, it's you know, phenomenal. the acme of the airport novel. Oh, if, you, if you've never read it, it's... I feel sorry for you if you never read it. Correct that situation. As and if you've possible. not seen the film, or you oh, have, yeah. go back and see it again. Because I mean, it, a, a, it is quite long, and you cannot believe that it sustains throughout. There's not a moment that it, that doesn't have incredible tension. B, what an extraordinary idea that you know it's based on an, an assassination attempt on, on De Gaulle, and we know in real life that that never happened. Indeed. Well, so there, there, we there, know there, it's there, there fail. were attempts. There were attempts. There were attempts. There was it starts never one, like, based on a real event, yeah. you know, but we we know it's going to fail. And uh, but and, still, and the tension is still. That, how is it going to fail? I tell you, the the, the the thing, the key thing about this book and the film is is uh, it's the absolute. Uh, there's the kind of film I lo- I can watch again and again and again because I just love to see, you know, heists. I love to see plans. Yeah. I, I love to be reminded of plans. I think it's a very male thing, actually. Oh, it is you know, the it, Italian job being one of the best examples. Yes, oh, absolutely. So satisfying. <laughs> yes, it is. Dude. And, you know, everybody can remember, you know, if you go into Somerset House nowadays, you know, which is a kind of art gallery and so forth, you know. But in those days, it was the uh, public records office, wasn't it? And yeah. so, you know, how do you go and how do you get a fa- passport? Well, you go and find the death records, you know, of, of somebody who died young and then you submit, a, you know, you order up a birth certificate and so forth. That's how you do it. All those little things were things that we all learned from Day of the Jackal. Completely. We all we all learned that in those days, French hotels used to have to lodge the passports of people staying from overseas with the police overnight, didn't they? That's right. That's how he gets rumbled in the end, you know. Um, all those little things we but learned about the, the world. It's the age before the internet, and they're trying to find yeah. out where this guy is, you know. And <laughs> now, of course, you'd immediately have every record of every... Well, you'd have his phone records. Or, you know, <laughs> absolutely, you know, cell phones, whatever, you could, you could track them. But it's just, oh, it's riveting. Also, he is, James Fox is, I think he's fantastic. At it. Oh, he's brilliant. Because he's really charming. And he appears to have some kind of external warmth, and yet he is the most sinister character. If yes. I remember rightly, he murders four people <laughs> who get in his way. One is a guy who's forging papers for him, forging a passport for him. Oh, as the, yes, as of the course. Old, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. As the army veteran. Yeah. And then tries to blackmail him, and, and he just he just knocks him out and locks him in one of his own chests in his room and leaves him to die. He murders the woman that he has the affair with. Do you remember that? You're spoiling this for people who haven't oh, seen it. Oh, God. No, <laughs> so, well, I also murdered the guy who meets in the, the Turkish bath, which is absolutely when he's masquerading as Per Lundquist. Yeah, but he, it he is does. fantastic. He, he's fantastic. And, he, and nobody in the history of movies has worn a cravat with quite such, you know. Aplomb. Aplomb. <laughs> yeah, as <laughs> James Fox does in Day of the Jackal. So that's that's our hot media tip, you know. For the, uh, oh, and the right. rescue. We should mention the oh, rescue too. Oh the rescue. God, we should time. mention for anybody who's um, who got um, uh, Disney Plus to see the Beatles get back, and I'm sure there'll be many of them. Um, the rescue is on Disney Plus, isn't it? Which is yes, it's it a is. very it's a very straight documentary. Uh, made about um, an incident that occurred about five years. 2018. Oh, okay. It's, it's the as... flooded, everyone will remember it. It's the, it's the time that the, 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 the football team of small children, the 12 kids and their coach were marooned in a flooded underwater cave system in Thailand. And it's about the three, mostly about the three uh, British divers who come in and and, uh, and find them. My God, there's, there's <laughs> tension for you. I mean, j- just to say, you know, everyone's got this thing about potholing. You either kind of really like potholing, a very, very small uh, minority, <laughs> 
or or you're absolutely terrified by the idea of being trapped underground. Well, this is worse because it's hot, <laughs> but underwater. <laughs> and as a, as a scuba or sorry, ex scuba diver, I can tell you that the psychological difference between diving in open water and you know if something went wrong, you, you could go up, spin your way to the surface, and you might. Yeah. Be to, to diving with solid rock above you is incredibly destabilizing. And these guys are diving not only through solid rock. The, the children, in fact, are one about one, one and a half miles from the entrance. To the Unbelievable. Cave. So think of a point one and a half miles away and imagine you've got to get to it by swimming underwater. In water, they describe as chocolatey brown. They can't even see, on some occasions, their own hands. And they're swimming through this water... And one of them gets trapped on the way back, runs out of air and doesn't survive. One of the army seals, you know, to find these kids. And the moment when they're, I mean, we've seen that bit of footage on the news, but the bit when they surface in the cave and they're aware from the from the scent in the air and from the, and the noises that, that, that there are human beings in this cave. It's fantastic. It's unbelievable. It's really, 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 really recommended. Thrilling. This is a junction in the word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. All right, we're joined by our birthday guest, patron supporter Paul Knox. Hello, Paul. Where are you? I don't, I, I'm in Hong Kong. I'm in a hotel room in quarantine. So this is a first. Birth. It's a first. We've first. never had that before. Yeah. How so long? So I, you I, came I, back I, from the UK, didn't you? And you, you're required to spend, yeah. was it three weeks in a hotel room? Three weeks in a hotel room, three weeks in quarantine. So uh, the only people I really have interaction with are the... Uh, the testers who come around to see me every two days and uh, give me the swabs. And uh, other than that, everything is left outside my door very efficiently. Um, so, yeah, the rest of the time I'm, I'm in solitary, as they say. So apart from you, you're working during the week, but uh, yep. you, you've been uh, you've been re-experiencing the Beatles get back. Haven't you? Tell us about this. Yep. Yeah, no, I've, I've been doing the thing of watching. I, I watched it when it all came out first time around. And I've been watching it on a day by day basis as you know, the, from the 2nd of January, whenever they first assembled in and watching that slot for, for the day. So uh, today was a, was a dead slot because it was the day they were moving into um, Savile Row. And uh, they, I think they dismantled Twickenham yesterday. And uh, today was the day I think they moved to Savile Row and suddenly realized that whatever Magic Alice, r- Magic Alex had r- ruffled up wasn't going to be good enough. And uh, the SOS had gone out to George Martin. So I think it, it starts again tomorrow. But well, it's, it's funny because George, Ma- George Martin is no longer working for Abbey Road, is it? He's working as an independent. And so they have to call Abbey Road. Oh, yes. And, and send their engineers around. That's the thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Are all these. You- Go Paul, on. are you listening to the uh, I Am The Egg Pod podcast? Because they're yeah, doing no, no, on Yes, I am. Egg. Yes, and that, they're brilliant. Yeah. Oh, they're the one. I, the one I recommend to anybody listening is Day Five, Andy Miller, uh, yeah. who comes up with amazing theories. One of his best theories, I think, is that is that Lindsay Hogg didn't make a film about the Beatles' unhappiness. He made a film about his own unhappiness that the Beatles wouldn't collaborate on his. Uh, elaborate idea for a film and then took it out on them with this negative edit, which I thought was really interesting. Well, I, I was going to say, I mean, one of my my, my questions was was uh, around it, which is what film was Michael Lindsay Hogg actually making? Because if it was a documentary, why is he in front of the camera so much? I mean, I've never seen a fly on the wall documentary where the director is so much present in front of the camera. And uh, the, the last day I watched was the day when it was, you know, the, the, and then there were two session. And that was Michael Lindsay Hogg sitting with I think, Neil Aspinall and Paul and Ringo and Linda and whoever else was there. And thought, why was the director sitting there in front of the camera? And what, what was he actually thinking he was doing? I, th- I don't think he was expecting to be in it at all. It was a TV film at that point, mm. wasn't it, that they were starting to make it, so there was certainly no mm. question of him being in it. But the difference was they were shooting everything all mm. the time because they mm. had no expense spared. So it just naturally picked up yeah. all the all the things that wouldn't go anywhere near the film. And, they and were, the they, reason that he's in there, I think, a lot of the time is that he is actually trying to negotiate with them about how yeah. the film should end. He yeah. has no sympathy at all for what they're going through. All he wants 
was the assurance that they're going to go to Tunisia or whatever. He it is. was Tunisia. Yeah. That's what Otherwise, he was. I haven't got a film. He you know. was Torchlight. He wants a Roman amphitheater, yeah. like <laughs> every that? film director wants a Roman amphitheater. Yeah. That's yeah. what he yeah. wants. But but I can see that. But I still find it strange that he did all of that in front of the camera, knowing that it was running. And, yeah, but and I, was that, says that it wasn't wasn't be I don't think there's any any thought that it would ever yeah. be shown at all. You know, yeah. they they're so relaxed off camera. You know, it's just yeah. they were in charge of it. So yeah, yeah. I will. Have, I'm glad you. I'm glad but, you're still getting value I, I just out had of a get couple, back. A couple of oh. other quick thoughts on on on, on that. What, one is a very trite point because I think you mentioned. Um, the Beatles' thinness, and particularly John Lennon's thinness. I think yes, it was you, yes. David. Yeah, I did. But the bit I really noticed, and which I really loved, was when because it was the first time I'd ever seen a Beatle dancing. It was when George yes. presents "I Me Mine," and first of all, John and Yoko. John and Yoko George, waltz, don't they? And and then John does this very strange flamenco dance, but he does it absolutely brilliantly. And, you know, because of you, you, you only ever saw John Lennon or, or any of the Beatles on stage behind a guitar. And I think John Lennon used to sort of bounce a bit and foot tap, and that was the only thing. But I, I haven't seen anybody else mention the Beatles dancing. As, and I think there's another clip later where Paul and John are dancing to yeah, something. They do. Yes, they do. They kind of dance balls. together. And, and well, and actually, actually, there is a famous sequence of the Beatles dancing because in a, in a hard day's night, yeah, Ringo. they go to a oh, disco. Yeah. And Ringo particularly, I think I think all of them actually, but I think Ringo, Ringo particularly, particularly was good. always the yeah. guy doing yeah. the the mashed potato or whatever. He yeah. was always he was always the first guy out on the dance floor flinging himself around. So yeah, it was not <laughs> in that sense it was not completely unprecedented. Um, but you know, it's just interesting. Yeah. It's just amazing the value people keep getting out, get back. It's yeah. absolutely cool. astonishing. Well, I think it will go on forever. I think somebody else commented about how it will be used uh, sort of for business training for, because they're showing the creative processes. Yes. But I think, the, I think I've also got this sort of nightmare feel that it will be used for sort of um, guidance training sessions or, yeah. you know, group therapy and, yeah, and people yeah. sort of saying, well... What do you, you know? How do you think George is feeling now? And how could Paul have handled that? Yes. So how could he have handled that? <laughs> better? How can he? How can he achieve what he wants to achieve? His goal is to get them to play a certain way on the arrangement. Yeah. <laughs> what <laughs> how he does it? Is it right or yeah. wrong? Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah, exactly. That's very funny. Yeah. That's a brilliant idea. You I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Paul, I've got to ask you this question because yeah. I flung this question to the massive last night. People talking about gig prices. Now that gigs are coming back on stream, yeah. people are complaining about how much they cost. I think the case in point was Elvis Costello's tour. I think it was 90 quid or whatever for certain tickets. Yeah. And, and people saying this is a bit much. And so I said, you know, what's the most you've ever paid? And uh, and how much would you pay to see who yeah. and where? And I got various responses in front of me. Neil Chrissy say he paid £180, which is a ticket price, not yeah. a town. See Van Morrison at a tiny club uh, called Subterranea in Lampbrook Grove a few years ago, and he says it was well worth it. Duncan uh, Duncan says he spent £60 to see the Stones at Hyde Park, and the price seemed irrelevant as most folks around us talked all the whole way through the set or took, took mm. endless selfies. Um, James Wilkinson, talking about Elvis Costello, he says he can't justify the price. Because he likes him, but his wife isn't that much of a fan. You mm. see, and I think this is a really interesting mm. part of the argument, yeah. you know, because you're paying for two very often, and yeah. one person is keener than the other one. Uh, Michael McHugh says £100 to see Roger Waters play Dark Side of the Moon in sequence, plus, plus a big selection mm. of his own stuff, and he thought that was worth every cent. What's the most you've ever paid, Paul? Can you remember? Uh it's one of two. One was uh, I saw Brian Wilson at um, what's the, the, the outdoor venue in Los Angeles. Um, uh, the Hollywood uh, Bowl. Right? I, I, no, it was the other one. It's called the, not the Olympic Bowl. I can't remember. It will come back to me. Uh, but it was... Candlestick uh, Park? It, is that, no, is that, no, yeah. no, that's San Francisco. Oh, yeah. um, there's another, but it's a great venue. It's... it's, it's um, and... I paid, but it was it involved a meet and greet with himself, Al Jardine, and um, Blondie Chaplin, as he called. Uh, um, right, right. And, and 
it also allowed me to go and see some of the the uh, warm up or what they're not they called the warm up the um sound check all right um and actually that was i can't remember if i paid five hundred dollars for it or something but it but it was a fantastic i mean it was it was a beautiful california night it was a fantastic concert and worth every penny i think i also paid four hundred for tickets to see the rolling stones at hyde park in the sort of enclosed area at the front and and again it was that that was the first time i'd ever seen the stones i thought it was probably going to be a one-off and and again enjoyed every moment of it all um, right but so there's now with those old school acts isn't there that the, 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 this might be your last chance to see them so they've, they've yeah. got you know and people are taking yeah. on along their children because they want you to be exactly. able to see grandchildren you saw keith richards or whatever so that's it, part exactly of it. so i think those are the two i paid most for the other factor there in the first in the case of the first yeah. one is you're in california yeah. therefore if you're a summer evening the weather's going to be fine yeah. that's going to yeah. make a huge difference isn't yeah it? Yeah. Whereas over here, it's a complete lottery. Lottery, going to Hyde Park, yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 it could, yeah. It could be absolutely exactly. terrible. Could be nice so, bit. who would you who would you pay most to see, Paul? Have you thought about that? Um, or have you have you I've ticked off all the ones? I, I, I've ticked off most of the ones I, I would want to see. Um, I think just because he's so unique, and actually, Chris Heath was reminded me about him when you did the session with him uh, Jonathan Richman I, I saw him in Los Angeles on the same thing and he is so unique live that if I didn't wasn't able to get a ticket through the normal routes I would pay way over the odds to to see him because he, he only plays small venues and, and he's so um unique um yeah well, I, I, don't come to, I don't immediately come to mind but I have seen most of the people I really want to see Right, right, fair enough, fair enough. So what were you, you wanted to ask us about Elvis Presley? Yeah, so just by way of brief background, uh, this book, Leaving the Building, which Eamon Ford, Eamon Ford. I, I heard about because Eamon Ford um, sort of talked about it on one of your, your podcasts, and it slightly overlaps with what I do in my professional career, which is helping people sort of think about their uh, estates and um, so I've, I've been writing a, I've written a review of the book but it was, it was the Elvis story in there from the business side that intrigued me but since then I've been sort of getting quite intrigued by Elvis himself again and there's somebody who was sort of bored up with the post-60 Elvis more than the, the pre-army Elvis um, and always quite liked him and sort of had, had all the compilation albums um, I've always known a bit about him without being a huge fan um, but this has sort of got me into, I, I, I've, I watched the, his comeback special, which I thought was absolutely a tremendous concert. And, but I, I just wonder, you know, I've never heard the two of you talk about Elvis and how you evaluate purely his musical legacy, his musical output, and whether, you know, other than the obvious type, um, you know, the greatest hits type tracks, whether you have favorite Elvis albums, tracks, uh, well, I, my my personal my personal favorite is the is the, is probably the, the phase of Elvis's career that I think is referred to in some quarters as, as Velvet Elvis, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of it's the early seventies. It's when he may went back to Memphis and uh, made well what became called the the Memphis album, didn't they? Mm -hmm. And I think the one I like most from that that era oh, it's a song called Long Black Limousine. Do you know mm. that? I don't know that, no. Which is not... about somebody dreaming about, you know, get, yeah. coming back to their town in a long black limousine. And, of course, the twist is they come back in a long black limousine because they're dead. Oh. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> it's yeah. absolutely fantastic. That's fantastic. You know, that stuff is the stuff that, that I, I probably play more than anything else. It's very odd because Elvis Presley seems to have sort of Slightly gone off the radar yep. in the last five years. That's my feeling. Whereas some of the Beatles seems seem absolutely pin sharp right now. Whereas somebody yep. like Elvis just seems to have drifted away. But then again, there's been times in the past when he drifted away yeah. and he drifted back one way or another. You know, there's well, often one there is a period of Elvis that's in up. focus, isn't there? You know, people, suddenly it's the very early phase that becomes fashionable or it's the early 70s phase. Yeah. The, the bit that never becomes fashionable is, is when the rhinestones start to appear and he goes to Las Vegas yeah. and stuff. Yeah. 
But there's a biopic coming out this year, which Baz Luhrmann has made um, with Tom Hanks playing Colonel Tom Parker. And oh, think, is that really? Yeah. It? yeah, in June. So I, I wonder if that will put Elvis back in the spotlight. It may well it do, may well because, do. It, yeah. because yeah. The, this is what tends to happen with kind of rock legacies, that, you know, they drift off and they yeah. come back in again. So, yeah. So, yeah. so you've been you've been writing a review of Eamon's book for a learned yeah. journal for, for yeah. uh, read by people who who plan estates. Yeah, That's re- yeah. Eamon will be thrilled to You'll know be that. So oh, no, it's okay. I've, I've I've spoken to him funny. Enough. All right. I've sent a copy of the review, but I've got to do another article based on his book in the next two weeks, which is really uh, not not totally based on his book, but just really the the, the, the going into the whole concept of how difficult it is to plan legacies. Yeah. Effectively. And, um, but, uh, but I, I have found the Elvis story, you know, really intriguing to get back into. And I don't know any books, because there's so much written about him. Oh, the, the, a lot the, of it is quite salacious, and or else it's sort of the mainstream books. Well, the, the two best books, I think, are the Peter Goralnik books, um, whatever they're called. Yeah. Are, uh, two, two, first yeah. part of his career, second part of his career. They're fantastic books, and yeah. uh, Peter Grelnick knew, knows the music and knows and knows Memphis and New Elvis and so forth. Yeah. So that's what I'd recommend. So it's your birthday. Have you actually yep. had it? Yeah, yeah, no, that was yesterday. Yes. All right. Okay. Yes. How was so your birthday in quarantine? Yes. <laughs> how did you? Uh, how does uh, one celebrate your birthday when you're on your own in, a, in quarantine in isolation? Well, Zoom calls and, and birthday cakes and everything. It, it all happened, so it was, it was yeah, fine. Yeah, all right. He celebrated it, and he's got a running machine, uh, listeners, got, yeah, yeah, <laughs> in exactly. his room. So yeah. it'd be pounding up and down of an evening. Paul, yeah. it's been lovely Very to good. talk to you. Yeah, um, lovely to talk to you both. Great yes, to talk thank to you. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, thanks for the tips on Elvis as well. Okay, and, and have a good rest of your time in quarantine. Yeah, thank you very it much. Bye. Bye. Happy Bye. birthday. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. The Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink and it's like being in the pub. So, right, any other business? We're joined by Alex Gold. How are you doing, Alex? I'm well. How are you guys? Yeah, yeah we're, we're in we're very good right. shape. Dave, Dave well, as you know, is, is, is never a man without a theory. <laughs> and uh, we were talking yesterday, and Dave, you had an absolute corker. <laughs> I think you should advance this to the nation, because I absolutely love this and think it's genuinely watertight. <laughs> Tell us what your theory is. Well, I was thinking, as I do think regularly, uh, about what happened to the Beatles in late 1966. Uh, and as everybody recalls, they stopped touring, didn't they? They played the last show at Candlestick Park in San Francisco in the summer. And then they 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 took a, 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 about six weeks off, I think, before they reconvened at, uh, at Abbey Road. And when they reconvened, they had all grown moustaches, yep. hadn't they not? They, sure had, they, yes. they, they had short hair and they had they all had moustaches. And let us assume that there was not a memo going round in, in the group saying, when you return to Abbey Road, could you please make sure you've grown the moustache? No, they had just all done it. But this marked the beginning of their, their transition from their live years to their studio years. It marked the transition from their kind of teenage years to their adult years. You know, It marked their transition from pop star to rock star, if you like. And it struck me that, that the, the unspoken message of, of a pop star growing facial hair is, please, please don't scream at me. But, but you were making the point that People probably didn't scream at people who had. I mean, they, 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 there are various people who started off without beards, like Cat Stevens, uh, and were screamed at, and possibly still screamed a little at after they had grown beards. But broadly, there's a change. Isn't there? There's the Jim Morrison without a beard, and there's the Jim Morrison with a beard. You, you send out the message that you are a serious artist, you possibly sit down to play. I don't know. These things are possible, aren't they? But you, I don't think... You know, there are major screams. I don't think they ever elicit major screams once they've got beards or facial hair. You cannot scream seriously at groups who have beards or <laughs> facial hair. I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen. This is a, now I know like Alex Gold is going to come along and say, 
Well, the Kings I'm of Leon. Leon fan, the yeah. Kings of Leon. I'm saying we, we, nobody seriously screamed at the Kings of Leon. What, what, what not it, what, compared, not compared to the Beatles or the well, Osmonds or the Jacks. What was it? You said to me, Dave. Was it? Was it? Was it? Was it can, can you not tell the difference between a scream and a, and a, and a stifled squeak? <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. absolutely. You know, they, you get, you get, you very often. You know, you, you'll get gigs where there, there'll be somebody, I don't know, Liam Gallagher or whatever, and he might have facial hair, and, and there might be a bunch of women in their twenties or thirties or even their forties. You know, squeaking. You know, satirically. It made me remember that is not. Yeah, yeah. That is not like the sound of 13, 14, 15 year old girls screaming, because that is a totally different thing. And I put it to you, Alex Gold, that nobody screams seriously at musicians with beards and facial hair. And I'm looking at you, Alex Gold. With your beard and well, your facial hair, I, I was about to say that I grew mine for, for precisely that reason. It was just getting out of hand, frankly. And, uh, <laughs> there you go. Get to the corner shop and get a pint of milk. I've been mobbed. Exactly. There you go. There you go. I remember having a very funny conversation with John Savage, the the, the, the music critic, in the Mojo office once, and he was talking. He's very pop music, John's, you know. And at that stage of his life, I wonder if it's still true. He hated the band, and I said, <laughs> "What is it? The band you don't like?" He said, "You can hear." the beards <laughs> I thought that was great <laughs> what he meant was everything that comes with the idea of beards do you know what I mean that's yeah. kind of true there, there are two types of music in this world there, are, there is beard music and there is chin music this is this is yeah. suede suede is chin music the band yeah, yeah, is beard yeah. music right 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 for right, example yeah. no, that's good yeah. now to, talking of um well, we're talking about classifications and so forth I was I was intrigued I was, I was looking at a thing online uh, what your favourite dad band says about you, and and I wanted to take take advantage of this opportunity to discuss the subject of dad rock, because I'm never entirely clear what it is. This is a list. This is a from American publication from McSweeney's. This is their their list of uh, of dad rock groups: The War on Drugs, The National, Wilco, Pavement, Pearl Jam, Bright Eyes, Father John Misty. Arcade Fire, Bon Iver, Modest Mouse, My Morning Jacket, My Morning Jacket, Pixies, Everclear, Pixies, Crows, yeah, guess <laughs> Death Cab for Cutie, the Mountain Goats, uh, Counting Crows, REM. Uh, so those are American ones. What do you understand by Dad Rock, Alex Gold? Um, and who, are, who are the English proponents of it? I, I suppose I'd define it as slightly sort of lump and plodding uh, guitar based <laughs> sounds, uh, mainly pro- probably made by four men, maybe five. Um, uh, but also mainly with a, with a male audience, don't you think? Yeah. So, so an audience that looks like a lot of thumbs. Um, Cause I think a really good example is looks happy like a lot of thumbs. <laughs> Do you think? Yeah, it's good. Then UK, UK. I think the happy Mondays is a good example. Ocean color scene. Our peak. Yes. Dad. Ocean color scene. <laughs> brilliant. That's very good. Uh, <laughs> Most things well are related. Anything that kind of... Uh, the jam, uh, you know, completely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Oasis would fall under that banner, no doubt. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, gosh. So you can't have dad rock if there's a, if there's a kind of electronic keyboard. Hot chip, yeah, for example, can, are not dad rock. Yeah, no, okay. no. Depeche Mode are not dad rock, are they? No, no. Depeche no. Mode are too sexy. Um, okay. Oh, that's hey. another thing. Uh, dad rock is not sexy. You cannot be sexy and play dad rock. It's, <laughs> there you go. Right. This good. is what we want. This is very this, good. This is yep. the, these are the sweeping statements so, to be, for, people for example, look to us for. Yeah, for example, uh, personal Jesus, sexy tune. Yes, yeah, the day I caught the train. Not sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, if anybody's got anything further to contribute to that um, that burning debate, we'd love to. We'd love to hear from you. I think. I think it's. I think it's groups that, that people tend to look at uh, support, like football teams. Do you think there's yeah. an element of that too? <laughs> yeah. Chris Heath, who we interviewed for the Word in Your Attic a couple of days ago, wrote a brilliant piece for Q Magazine in about 1988 about travelling with a bunch of Happy Mondays fans from Victoria Station on a coach to Paris to see them play. Fantastic. And it was just like that. You know, it was just a sort of football experience. You know, you're going to an away match and expecting them to lose, which they did. And I think that kind of, that kind of, it's a very male thing. And that's one of the main things about Dad Rock, I think. Yeah. I've got some readers' correspondence in front of me here. Um, Adam Burry says, have you ever had a record that works as well on 45 as it does on 33? <laughs> that's good. <laughs> 
He That's says he, he's just bought the fantastic new covers EP from Bridget May Power on vinyl. Yeah. And put it on at 33, not realising it was meant to be played at 45. And sounded like Anthony and the Johnson. Still very rewarding. I have one, actually, Adam, that I can I can propose here. And I, I, I can no longer do it myself because I haven't got a 45 RPM copy of Ruby Don't Take Your Love to Town by Kenny Rogers in the first edition, which some of you may remember. Really good record. Because it has such a deep register vocal, doesn't it? And if you play that at yeah. 33, like my flatmate used to play yeah. it at 33 in 1970, it sounds like the bluesiest, swampiest, lightning slim record you've ever heard in your life. It just absolutely perfect when it goes down from from 45 to 33 so oh, i'm gonna I'm, I'm having said that i'm gonna make efforts now to find to see if i can buy a copy of 45 of that record on discogs or whatever and i'll i'll play it to you to demonstrate when, when i've done that uh Ed, edward gay wants to know what we think about jeremy spencer out of fleetwood back he says he didn't he didn't get the um his, his contributions as a songwriter and vocalist uh, seem to be woefully, woefully under, uh, overlooked in the Fleetwood Mac story. His contributions on early albums seem purely limited to bottleneck. Is he still like with us, Jeremy Spencer? Yes, he is. He is, because he I disappeared, think... didn't he, and joined a religious cult? Well, he think. did, and in 1971. Yeah. He walked out on Fleetwood Mac in San Francisco. Yeah. And joined the Children of God. Yeah. And didn't come back, really. But, yeah, he's still around. And the fascinating tale, because Mark and I are old enough to remember Fleetwood Mac, the rugby shirt years, oh, aren't we? Yeah. Which was when oh. Fleetwood, Fleetwood Mac first came to prominence. They were a kind of rave up rock and roll band, weren't they? All yeah. used to wear striped rugby shirts. And Jeremy Spencer was the chief lad and kind of um, show-off, wasn't he, in the he group? Was. He used to, didn't he used to sport a prosthetic penis and things like that? He, didn't he? he? He did all these kind of oh, mad. Yeah. I can't he, believe I've forgotten it if he did, but yes. He did. He used to He used to also dress up as, as a kind of rocker, grease his hair back, didn't he? Yeah. Because the B-side of one of Fleetwood Mac's singles is credited to, I'm just dredging this from the back of my memory here, Credited to Earl Vincent and the Valiants, and it's called, Alex, close your ears, it's called Somebody's Gonna Get Their Head Kicked In Tonight. And that was, that was, <laughs> it's Alex, the youngest generation so easily shocked. <laughs> <laughs> that My the, gosh. That was the knockabout humour of 1970 or whatever it was. It wasn't and anyway, the leader, the leader of that was Jeremy Spencer. He was always out on that flank of Fleetwood Mac. So he was probably the last person anybody was expecting to wander off and, and join the children, exactly, of, become a children kind of, of God child and, 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 and never come back. But and no, I remember him with Fleetwood Mac with... Uh, with great uh, great affection, yeah. uh, I, we we have to tell the story about the Pope has gone record shopping. Um, this is a great story because <laughs> the Pope, the Pope, there's a picture of him coming out of a record record store in, in Rome. You know, and he, <laughs> there's a little co comment where he says, "Oh, he was spotted by a journalist, or whatever." And I suppose the journalist just kind of doing his job to to report that I was there. But the interesting pop fact is, the Pope is dressed dressed in full papal. The Pope. He's got How the did anybody recognise? I mean, part of that he hasn't told. Where he isn't wearing, I don't know, a mitre and carrying an orb and scepter or whatever else is missing. I don't really know, but he is dressed as the Pope. So unless the streets of Rome are full of people dressed as the Pope, which uh, I, I don't know, it just didn't rather he did. And he apparently, he apparently gets around the Eternal City yeah. in, a, in, in a small fiat, yeah, <laughs> rather, rather than a Pope mobile. So you know, one of the millions of indistinguishable fiats pulls up at the curb and out gets. The Holy Father yeah. goes into a small record shop. Runs, by, you got anything by, by so Kelsey? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're reading a cellar full of noise, Mark. I am. Oh my lord, that's an amazing book, isn't it? They've just I read it for a long it, time. They've republished it. This is Brian Epstein's. Um, uh, biography that came, autobiography that came out, written with Derek Taylor, actually, it came out in 1964, I think, didn't it? 
And, Probably. Uh, oh, yeah. it's it's absolutely fantastic. It's just been republished with a with an interview by Craig Brown, a very very good one. What an extraordinary story that is. Just you know the the the. the it's astonishing among many astonishing things is the fact that he doesn't at no point does he declare obviously his sexuality but it's brilliantly hinted at he talks about being in the army doesn't he yeah, he says, I'm the, I'm the most the worst soldier imaginable <laughs> and how absolutely ineffectual he is um but it's very very touching and uh, and also you're interested in the fact that he's theater that he's you know rada and his whole yeah, theatrical yeah. kind of background that that he he understands that what makes the show Biz and the, and the, the, the craft, the, the stagecraft element of the Beatles that makes them successful. But it also struck me that that it's his it's his sexual uh, orientation actually that's immensely useful in the way that he sees. Yeah, the Beatles. yeah. he sees yeah. the Beatles entirely from the point of view of what was their main constituent audience in the, in the early days, which was which is which is uh, teenage girls. Is th- and he understands that he's the dynamic of what makes through, that through the eye of desire, isn't it? Yeah, it <laughs> is. <laughs> that's the, that's the way he does it. Yeah, and uh, which is something he had in common with a huge amount of. Uh, uh, managers of uh, very successful managers of, of pop groups down the years so it's out it's republished is it it's republished it's oh i i, I thought it was absolutely riveting and it's I, you know it's interesting also that he that he wrote it so young because he what he's yes. recording is is something that he has never happened before that level of of uh, of pandemonium and it's about them being imprisoned in hotels and it's about fame and it's about adulation and celebrity you know and a it's never really happened before but b he obviously doesn't expect it to last it's 1964 this cannot last and there's a lovely element of 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 revenge about it too and he talks about dick rowe at decker now he he kind of uh he reiterates everything that dick rowe had said about guitar groups and how the beatles will never catch on and you know it it, oh it's it's so interesting really good book This podcast was brought to you by The Word. (laughs) 